Hi, everybody. My name is Keith Howard. And uh, contrary to what Farrell said, I don't know everything there is to know about Kalamazoo. I don't even pretend to, but um, nonetheless, uh, this is a, a little blurb about the breweries that used to be here. I am passionate about what used to be, I guess. And that doesn't mean I'm stuck in the past necessarily, but um, I'm fascinated by where things were and what things were, you know, what, what was around and um, amazed at how similar sometimes, I mean, even 100 or 150 years ago, the similarities between uh, their lives then and our lives now. Um, so uh, we collect postcards, we collect all kinds of different things and little bits of it, but uh, this is a, a little bit about, uh, about Kalamazoo Brewing. Um, first off, before I start, can everybody hear me okay? Because I didn't put a mic on for this. So, so okay, if you can't hear me or whatever. Um, we can. It'll be a little darker, but we can certainly do that. Would you like that? Let's do that. Is that better? All right, very good. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and start. When um, we talk about Kalamazoo and, and uh, talk about the phrase, you know, made in Kalamazoo, what products come to mind from our past? What, you know, when somebody says something was made in Kalamazoo, what do you associate? What do you think about? Stoves, Stoves paper, Cars, checker, cab, checker cab, automobiles. Sorry? Oh, corsets, yep, absolutely. Shakespeare, fishing, yep, exactly. Sorry? Saddles. Phonographs, yep. Duplex Phonograph Company was here. What do you think the first product was that was ever made here? Well, of course, now we associate beer, right? I mean, we, our number two beer city <clears throat> will be number one next year. So what do you think the first product was that was ever, that really ever kind of put Kalamazoo on the map? Any guesses? Celery, that was, that was a big one, but this goes back before that even. Oddly enough, it was whiskey. <laughs> um, and uh, the reason I bring this up, um, yeah, actually, um, Luke Whitcomb um, ran a distillery over by the river, and oddly enough, it was on the very exact same piece of ground that Arcadia just built theirs on. So. Uh, the Arcadia folks are on a uh, hallowed ground, I guess, for, as far as Kalamazoo goes. But um, yeah, <laughs> Luke's Best was famous um, up until about the time of the Civil War. Um, in fact, um, it was used during the Civil War by our government as a, um, for medicinal purposes for the, the soldiers that were injured. So. Um, so anyway, Luke's Best was supposedly known all over the place. So, um, but we're not here to talk about whiskey. We're here to talk about um, a different beverage and something that would, uh, uh, whiskey was cheap. It was easy to manufacture. Um, you could buy a gallon of it from Luke fresh out of the still for 25 cents. Um, a, a gallon of two year old would set you back 50, you know, a, a half a buck. So. Um, but that was cheap, it was easy to transport, uh, didn't spoil, that kind of stuff. Beer, on the other hand, was different. It was a, a, a product that, that had a shelf life, um, probably wouldn't transport too easily before the days of the railroad, so you could certainly uh, put a barrel on a stagecoach and, and run it halfway across the state, but I, I can't imagine it being in very good shape by the time it got here. So. Um, so anyway, what we're going to talk about, I, I kind of split this into three kind of segments. Um, the first one are the, the first couple of breweries that were here, at least that I've found. Um, now, I, again, I'm by no means an expert on this. I've, um, you know, as my father would have said, I know enough to get myself in trouble, um, hence why I'm here. But uh, nonetheless, um, uh, a couple of the earliest breweries that, that I've been able to, to locate and, uh, and document. Um, 
a middle section about really kind of a heyday around the, the Civil War era and shortly after. Um, and then uh, the third part is kind of the, the waning of it up until the time of Prohibition. So that's sort of the, the three segments that we're going to look at tonight. Um, and then, of course, it you know, famously picked up again in the 1980s, thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Bell and his crew and, and, uh, and all of that. But we're not going to get into that. We're going to do the earlier stuff. So, um, all right. So to kind of wind this thing backwards, um, if we kind of envision Kalamazoo in 1832, and it was just founded, uh, basically four log huts, right? Just, just a handful of log huts, um, not a whole lot going on. Um, but within four short years, by 1836, um, we had all kinds of things going on. Uh, there was a post office, a city hall, um, we had churches, blacksmith shops and such. This would have been Main Street. Uh, this is off of a 1909 postcard, probably, probably published to, uh, for the silver anniversary of, of Kalamazoo. But uh, nonetheless, this is roughly what it would have looked like. Um, the dry goods, um, and you see the post office there, that would have been kind of the corner of Portage Street. Uh, looking kind of southwest uh, up Main Street or what's now Michigan Avenue. So different site than today, but certainly a lot going on since then. And I didn't realize this until um, I ran onto this, but uh, um, they made no bones about, okay, there was beer here, there was beer over here. So there was beer in Kalamazoo at that point in time. Um, in fact, by 1837, there was a note in the paper um, Kind of going on about what we had here and and within this five-year period you know go back to the the log cabins within that five-year period now we're the township population was over 1300 um, and according to this article we had four large convenient well-conducted taverns a grist mill a sawmill a distillery at least one brewery 11 dry goods stores, three provision stores, a silversmith, a jewelry store, a printing office, a weekly newspaper, a bookstore, on and on and on. So pretty much a well-developed um, little town here. And we did have, according to this anyway, one professional brewery at that point in time. Um, the problem is, um, at least for our talk tonight, uh, I don't know where it was and I don't know who ran it. Um, and I have some thoughts about it, but we'll, uh, you know, we'll come back to those as we go along. Uh, keeping in mind, this is still nine years before the railroad came through. So the only connection with Kalamazoo, between Kalamazoo and Detroit, or Kalamazoo and Westward and, and other parts, um, were wagons and stagecoaches and such. So uh, still very much the early days. Um, so a lot of home brewing was done. Now this was also in the newspaper um, in 1838, so we're still five or six years old here, um, with recipes for how to brew your own. Um, one called cheap and agreeable table beer, uh, combined water, molasses, and yeast. Uh, spruce beer took about that same recipe and added um, spruce branches or berries. Um, uh, almost a, a, a gin sort of a quality, except we're still talking about beer here. Um, sugar beer was just straightforward water, sugar, and yeast. Um, that article warned that that recipe wouldn't keep very long, so um, you had to drink up. Um, also, another one talked about um, the ability to brew uh, with available materials, and one were uh, a green pea shells. Um, said that they apparently resemble, closely resembled malt, so um, they would add some wood sage or hops to it and brew it up and drink it down. So, um, so that was kind of the home brewing scene here. I, I don't think I would expect any of the local breweries to resurrect those recipes anytime soon. So, um, but anyway, um, so what we're going to do, we're going to jump into a spaceship Google here and kind of look and see where some of these things were located and where things were around, and what was around it, and Again, like I say, not so much, I, I try not to bore you guys with facts and figures and all of that stuff, but try to attach places and faces to these things. Um, so this first one, we're gonna jump across over by WMU, um, actually over by the Sealy Center there, next to Waldo Stadium, and look at John Hall's Kalamazoo Brewery. 
Um, this was an operation. Um, it was opened by February or by uh, January 1837, or sorry, 1846. John Hall um, ran the thing. He was in Kalamazoo, or at least there was a John Hall in Kalamazoo by 1837. Um, I can't say that he was that original brewer that was in that Gazette ad. I told you I had some ideas about that. Um, he might have been. There was certainly a John Hall around. Um, and this, but this was a new big brewery that was built. Um, and this was west of the village along Arcadia Creek, um, where they described as where Genesee Prairie Road, which is what we call Oakland Drive now, um, meets the Paw Paw Road, and that we would know as Michigan Avenue. Of course, Stadium Drive wasn't there. Um, the railroad had just gone through, so the, the railroad was there. Um, but this opened in 1846. Um, so if we take an aerial view of that same sort of spot, um, you can see the Sealy Center and Waldo Stadium there. Um, this is a map from 1853 um, that shows that same area. Genesee Prairie obviously is, is um, um, Oakland Drive. Uh, the Paw Paw Road is Michigan Avenue. Um, and right in the very middle there, we see the brewery. Um, it's right next to J.M. Johnson's factory there. Um, Johnson was a manufacturer, it turns out, of, of cloth, of clothing. It didn't manufacture clothing, they manufactured the cloth. Um, but the brewery was right next door, uh, and there was a house next to it. Um, and so that was there for actually for several years. Um, in 1849, it was taken over uh, by a, an Englishman uh, named Benjamin Hall. Um, no relation to John Hall that I could find, but perhaps. Um, I don't think so, though. Um, and a New Yorker named Jason Russell. Um, they ran it from 1849 until it was offered for sale. Um, in 1852, and at that time the Gazette described it as one of the best and most convenient establishments of its kind in the state. Um, a house went along with it. Um, seems like it, it took them a while to sell it, so it was probably for sale for close to a year, um, but nonetheless that was the first kind of really well-documented brewery in town. Um, now again, if we, if we jump across town, from Hall's Brewery and go over to the opposite side of town, or actually kind of in the center of town, um, right up next to where the railway station is today. Um, this is where Holmes and Harlan's Brewery was. And um, we're talking about James Holmes and Jacob Harlan. Now Holmes would be the very same man that took over um, the, well, we'll get to him in a second, sorry. So Holmes and Harlan ran this. Jacob Harlan was another that I think might have been an original brewer here. He is the only one of the brewers that shows up on the um, 1840 census. Um, it, although it lists him as agriculture, there, the 1840 census doesn't give us a whole lot of information. They're just tick boxes for different types of, of you know, whether they're in manufacturing or whatever. So, you know, I mean, it could be a loose association, grain, et cetera, with brewing. I don't know that for a fact, but nonetheless, um, Hall, or Holmes and Harlan ran their brewery. They opened it in 1846. Um, this was on the east side of Burdick Street, um, right about where, uh, or kind of kitty corner from the Michigan Central Depot. Um, it's the, the building that's built there now is part of um, the Kalamazoo Gospel Mission, so it, it's at that point. Uh, but 1850 production tells us they consumed about 1,100 bushels of barley and produced about 6,000 gallons of beer that year. So not a huge operation by any means, but uh, um, certainly, uh, certainly significant. So um, those were really the two breweries. Now here's um, uh, back to that 1853 map that I was telling you about or that I showed you the other one was on. Um, if we kind of, you can see the brewery is going to be right here. Here's the passenger depot. At that time, the passenger depot was right in the middle of the railroad tracks. Um, the freight depot was separate. That set over here. 
Uh, if we kind of zoom in a little bit and twist that, you can get a better idea. Um, the brewery is right down here now. So this would be the top of the screen now is west. So um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of where that was. Um, Hall and Holmes uh, ran it. Now is, this is where uh, Benjamin, Holm, or Benjamin Hall comes back into the picture. Um, he was the one that ran the, the other brewery that I just told you about. Um, he left that operation, sold it, whatever the reason is, we don't know. Um, but went into business over here and joined Jacob Harlan. Um, or, or joined, Harlan was gone, sorry. He joined uh, um, Mr. Holmes. Um, I did find one reference that, that referenced that perhaps in a previous life as Woods Brewery. So maybe this could have been the location of that 1837 or 1836 brewery. Again, I don't know, but uh, nonetheless, these guys produced about 11,000 gallons a year. Um, Hall died in 1859. Um, Holmes continued on by himself until about 1867. Um, and you can see they were advertising for, uh, for barley and for malt. They wanted to pay cash for up to 5,000 bushels. Um, so they were, uh, they were ready to go. Um, but those are, are basically the first two that we can document. Um, if we jump ahead now a little bit, um, brewing changed considerably um, here in town, especially around the time of the Civil War or soon thereafter. So um, we'll call this the second round. So after those first couple of breweries, one went away, then the other kind of went away, but a whole bunch of new ones came around. Um, so 1856, we had two breweries and two distilleries here. Um, one distillery, of course, I showed you at the beginning. Um, but by 1865, right after the Civil War, um, there were seven in town, at least seven. Um, we had one on North Burdick Street, um, one on Walnut Street, one on Winstead Street. Um, one on the Plank Road south of town, one on Asylum Avenue, which is now Oakland Drive, uh, one on Kalamazoo Avenue, and one on Olmstead Road or, or um, uh, Lake Street. Did you have a question, ma'am? Yeah, I was going to say Asylum Avenue was the original name for Oakland Drive. That's right. Yep, that's correct. Yep, very good. Very good. Yes, sir. Winstead? Oh, we'll get to it. It's a street that doesn't exist anymore. So I'll show you where each of these things were. All right, so we'll get back in our, our uh, little thing here. We'll fly across town. Um, actually, we're going to go just a couple of blocks north of there. Um, and this one, we're going to look at George Judge's malt house. Um, George Judge was a maltster, a malt maker. And of course, if, if you know your grains and such, malt um, is where they take grains like barley or whatever and let it sprout. Uh, and, and just when it begins to sprout, the sugars are activated. Um, then they dry it and grind it, and that makes cattle feed and makes all kinds of other stuff. But that's one of the main ingredients for beer. So um, Judge's Malt House was there. Um, this was um, bordered on the west by Rose Street, on the east by North Burdick, on the north by North Street, um, and um, the south by Frank Street. So he had pretty much that whole block. Um, he actually took over the second distillery building, which was Isaac Moffat's, uh, when he moved out. So uh, Judge was born in England. He was a, an Englishman, uh, about 1820, came to Kalamazoo in 1853, opened his malt house in 1857, um, and, and did a pretty brisk business. Um, now, in this case, he was paying cash for barley uh, because he would, uh, you know, he would do the processing, of course. Uh, his big thing, his main focus of his business was wholesale and retail, malted barley, rye, and hops. Um, but he also did some brewing in the back room and I guess was well known for a, a, a light amber ale and um, a real nice dark ale. So. Uh, what you're looking at is an 1867 drawing. This is one of those bird's eye view drawings. And if you zoom in really close, um, this would be looking west, southwest. Uh, and this is North Street along here, and this is Burdick Street. So, um, and that's Judge's Malt House that sits right there. Um, 
So he ran um, actually for uh, a few decades. Um, by 1880, um, he was one of the leading suppliers to the Goebel Brewing Company, which was in Detroit. Um, at that time, a huge growing concern, um, a, a big deal. Um, also, his son-in-law was John Bomersheim. Uh, Bomersheim was a local bottler, and he was the local distributor for Goebbels. And as we'll point out here in a few minutes, um, competition from outside really became a big deal for these local breweries, and that was um, one of the reasons a lot of them went away when they did. So, uh, Judge retired in 1882. Um, he passed away in 1893, um, although his son-in-law kept on there, actually moved his whole bottling operation there. He moved his tavern there um, and moved everything. He had a huge concern at that point. Um, unfortunately, the entire block was destroyed by a fire in 1895, so it wiped out everything. Um, so there's obviously no sign of him anymore, but... Um, the un I should point out, um, one thing that does exist, that block that I'm telling you is split from north to south um, by Judge Court. Um, you'll notice a little street that goes right through the middle of that block, um, and that's where obviously the name comes from. So um, that's Judge Court. All right, so if we leave Judge's Malt House now, we're going to travel south um, a little bit down into the area where uh, Bronson Hospital is. And so if you kind of look where this is, there's a, the block where Bronson um, is right here. This is where um, what would end up being um, Locker's Brewery was. Um, at this point, when we begin, it was called the Kalamazoo Brewery, not to be confused with the other Kalamazoo Brewery that we talked about a few minutes ago, which makes it confusing. but. Um, the first person involved with this that I could locate uh, was a guy named Lorenz Bre um, Brentano. He was a German. Um, he was in Kalamazoo between 1850 and 1860. Um, he took over and, and essentially opened this brewery about 1857. Um, the address was at 7 Walnut Street. Uh, it was actually just on the south side of Walnut, just east of Burdick, a, a block or so. Um, Brentano ran it for about three years um, and then left Kalamazoo and actually became quite a famous politician in Chicago. He was a, a famous senator and, and uh, had quite a long career doing that. But uh, um, he left about 1860 and turned it over to a Peter Herbelsheimer, also a German, um, who then ran it for a few years. Um, here's the 1874 bird's eye view. There were three bird's eye view maps done. So we'll kind of sample each as we go along, but uh, clearly shows the brewery parked right here. Um, this would be Walnut Street. Uh, you see Jasper Street up here, um, kind of drops off into, the, into oblivion here, but Portage Creek runs right through here. So there would have been ample water supply and such. Um, and uh, he was, um, Brentano was advertising his Bavarian lager and ale um, during the 1850s, so. Um, but he ran it for a few years, or a couple of years, and then left. Um, and we see uh, Barney Locker, Bernhard Locker, he was born in Württemberg, Germany, or, or originated there. Um, and he opened his part, or, or took over this operation in 1863. Um, he was advertising good hay and harvest ale and beer at nine bucks a barrel. Um, he also advertised a, a celebrated Bach beer. Um, and he ran this operation for quite a while, um, up through the Civil War and into the 1870s. Um, about 1878, though, his luck seems to have run out. Um, one of his barns accidentally burned. Some kids, I guess, were playing with matches or playing with fire or whatever. One of his barns burned. Um, a short time after, he defaulted on a mortgage um, and ended up having to, to sell the whole thing. Um, it was sold at public auction in 1879. The property was sold for re or, um, residential development. Um, and he actually opened uh, a tavern uh, or saloon downtown on, on Main Street. 
Um, but he died a year later, so he, he passed away about 1880. Um, interestingly, though, the property, one of the buildings survived into the 1960s. Uh, an apartment building. Um, there was a thing in the Gazette that it was, it was being torn down to make way for Bronson Hospital, interestingly enough. Uh, but that was the remains of old of, uh, Barney Locker's Brewery. So, um, so that's that one. Um, let's travel now just a little bit north of there and hopefully we'll answer your question about Winstead Street. Um, we're going to talk about another one right actually right in the middle of this parking lot called the Portage Brewery. Um, now, right now it's a large parking lot. We can uh, um, kind of see how that was, but 100 or 150 years ago there were a couple of more streets here. Uh, Winstead Street ran south, ran straight south right out of that intersection. Um, we can still see the remains of Edgar Street here, um, although it's kind of attached to the parking lot. And we have Jane Street um, that goes through the middle. And the Portage Brewery, I'm um, sorry, the Portage Brewery um, sat right on the west side of Winstead Street, right about um, just north of Jane there, right in the middle of that parking lot. Um, and that was built by a, a gentleman named Nicholas Bauman. He was also a German. Uh, born about 1828, he was in Kalamazoo by 1855, um, and a year later he built this, this little brewery down on Winstead Street um, at what was then called the, the lower end of Portage Street. Uh, Portage Street essentially ended at Lovell, and it, and it was the, um, the road, to, it was known by the, after that as uh, um, farther south as, as the, the road to the sawmill. Um, so it was just kind of a, a little two-track country road from there on. But um, nonetheless, that's where the Portage Brewery was. Um, he uh, ran it for about three years, um, and then he ran into a conflict um, with a gentleman, if you remember back a couple of breweries ago. Remember the name Peter Herbelsheimer? Well, Herbelsheimer apparently visited... Um, this guy at, uh, um, uh, at his brewery, and they got into an altercation, um, and um, Bauman ended up being doused with boiling beer. He was, he was burned quite badly, I guess. Um, so he had to give up the brewing. Um, Herbelsheimer landed himself in jail for 40 days, uh, but uh, um, Mr. Bauman had to, to leave the business, so it turned it over at that point to to Sessiman and Company in the, in the spring of 1859. Um, and they advertised a choice article of ale and beer expressly for family use, an excellent, wholesome, healthy beverage. Um, you start to see these kind of descriptions coming into things uh, because, believe it or not, even this early, the temperance movement was beginning to gain ground. Um, and anything alcohol was, was begun to be evil and, and uh, and this, well, the breweries wanted to separate themselves from the distillers. And so fine whiskey had its, its share of problems, which I should have noted at the very beginning. Alcohol consumption in America at this time was three times per capita what it is today. So there were certainly, we certainly had an appetite for it um, and, you know, all the problems that would have come along with it. But yeah, that, that temperance movement began to kind of catch hold. So you see a lot of these advertisements where the brewers are trying to distance themselves and, and, and sort of take the European approach as this was liquid bread. This was beer. This was healthy. You should drink it. And, and even the ads showed strapping young men in the fields and, and such. And, uh, and so that was kind of the, the product placement, as it were. Um, you start to see that come into line. So... Um, but Sessman ran it for a few years. Um, by 1864, it was being run by Hughes and True, William Hughes and Samuel True. Um, they left after a few years, and it was the same building was ran um, by a Frederick William Cipher from about 1870 to 1872. Uh, you'll see his name come up later on again, too. Um, and by 1881, the building had been abandoned. They were out of the brewery business. And it was sold for uh, um, sold to be used as a uh, a machine shop. So um, that at that point it was called the Burr Oak Brewery. Okay, 
Um, so that was the Portage Brewery um, on Winstead Street there, which clearly is no more. If we take a spin from there, we're going to drop way out south now. We're going to go south of town. Remember I told you this was way out in the country at that point. Um, this is down on, on what today is Lover's Lane. And we're going to look at the Birchnall Brewery here. Um, <clears throat> this was uh, Joseph and Dorothy Birchnall. They were both from England, uh, emigrated to Kalamazoo or to the U.S. to Kalamazoo, ended up in Kalamazoo about 1858. Um, their brew was home brewed ale, um, also called Joe's Double X. Uh, quite famous locally for quite a period of time. And because that was so far out of town, their operation was was actually on what was then known as the Plank Road, um, the road to uh, uh, Three Rivers. Um, so um, he made arrangements so you could go drop your order at a grocery store there on Portage Street, and within a day or so or whatever, they deliver your beer. Yes, ma'am? You are spoiling my surprise. Yeah, <laughs> you are absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second. That obviously, whoops, that's Joe and, and Dorothy. And, and I include her in this too because um, she clearly was a partner in this. It wasn't just Joe's wife. She was a partner. Uh, in fact, she pretty much ran the operation at one point in time. So, um, But yeah, the Birchnalls, and there are a variety of different spellings on this. There's uh, Birchnall with two L's seems to be the preferred. Uh, Birchnall with one L, Birchnell. Um, you see all kinds, but uh, it all is the same thing. Um, this was on the Kalamazoo and Three Rivers Plank Road, which we would know today as, as uh, um, Millam Drive, or, or sorry, as uh, um, Lover's Lane. Um, and it's just about across from uh, where Millam Park is. Millam Park would be down here, so just a little bit north of there on the west side. So. Um, they ran uh, that until 1873 when Joe passed away. She continued on, and interestingly, uh, ginger ale was her specialty. Uh, but she remarried, uh, about three years later, she remarried um, a gentleman named Robert Walker in 1876. Um, and we see a couple of references to Walker's Plank Road, Robert Walker's Plank Road Brewery. Um, so clearly they went back into business, tried to sort of rekindle this thing after Joe's passing. Um, it didn't last long. There are virtually no references to the, the Plank Road Brewery after this one year. So um, obviously he either left or passed away. Something happened. Uh, she passed away in 1892. Um, the whole complex, the barn and, and the house and everything, uh, burned a year later, so or burned actually later that year. So, um, but uh, yeah, Dorothy Birchnall. Uh, and and what I was going to ask you is if the name Birchnall means anything. If anybody is familiar with that, and and clearly you you spilled it. The um, our World War One war hero Joseph B. Westnage was Joseph Birchnall Westnage, um, and his mother was. The Birchnall's daughter. So his grandparents, you could see Colonel Joe out fighting in World War I. Um, and uh, yeah, his, his grand, grandparents were brewers in town. So um, think of that next time you go down West Nage Avenue, right? Um, so anyway, um, that takes care of them. If we go now kind of back across town, back over towards where Western is. Um, we kind of zoom up across. We're going to go back to that same spot, actually the same building um, that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and this time, this is going to be um, the Kalamazoo Spring Brewery. Um, uh, a German named Sebastian Syke um, and a French master brewer named George Fogel um, formed a partnership in 1856 and took over that old brewery building. So it had been empty for a few years, a couple of years. Um, they took over. Um, eventually, they were joined by Frederick William Seifert. Um, you recognize his name from that one we just talked about in Portage. Uh, he began here, worked with them for a few years, and then went to the Portage Brewery. But uh, Syke and Fogel made ale and lager beer, um, actually, for quite a while. 
Um, and that was in the old building there. Um, now, remember the, the gentleman that got burned quite badly, Nicholas Bowman? Well, he comes back around about 1862. He's healed and he's ready to get back into the business. So he joins uh, these guys. Um, Syke left in 1863 and actually joined the army, went to fight in the Civil War. Um, he survived the war, by the way, I guess. Um, but nonetheless, um, then it became the Nicholas Bowman and Company um, and was Kalamazoo's only steam brewery, steam power brewery. Here we see the 1873 map, that same spot. Here's where the railroad goes through. Here's Michigan Avenue. Here's now Asylum Avenue. Again, we, you know, we know it as Oakland Drive. Um, and again, right about where Waldo Stadium would be, or, or more accurately, where the, um, the power plant is, um, we see the Kalamazoo Steam Brewery. Now that building burned, a, a passing train apparently touched off a fire uh, and burned that building down in 1867. Um, and they rebuilt it. So the Spring Brewery was no longer the Spring Brewery. It was now the Kalamazoo Steam Brewery. Um, Bauman ended up selling out of that business in 1871. He went on to become quite a local developer. Um, he did a lot of building. Um, the popular rumor is that he built the Peninsula Building downtown where, where our root beer comes from. Uh, it's actually not true. He didn't build that building. That was there when he came through. He built another building on the north side of the street called the Peninsula Building, um, and that was his. But uh, uh, nonetheless, urban lore, it's even on the historical marker that that was his building there. And it, it truly was not. But nonetheless, uh, Fogel and Bowman ran it for a while, then Bowman left. Um, in 1871, and um, Fogel ended up on his own for a while, uh, but they were brewing 46,000 gallons annually, uh, and again, the Gazette called it a superior article of ale and lager. Um, the, those sort of three-dimensional bird's-eye view maps, um, there are, again, there are three of them of Kalamazoo. Um, this is the 1874 one. Interestingly enough, it shows the brewery quite clearly in the foreground of that map. So next time you, if you see that somewhere, this is what it looks like. And sure enough, this is the brewery um, sitting right down here next to the railroad tracks where Michigan, I, Michigan Avenue and Asylum split. Here's a little more of a close up. Um, we don't have any photographs of it, but uh, um, we have a drawing that, that shows where it is. Uh, the third of those maps was done in 1880. Uh, basically the same view. You see Kalamazoo College on the hill here and Lower Hall down here on South Street. Um, again, the same area and again, the same brewery in the same spot. So um, those buildings, if you see that, uh, that map, those are, are the old Kalamazoo brewery there, the steam brewery. Um, so now we see a George Neumeyer come along, 1872. Um, and another German, he was a German obviously, and another German named Leo Knast came along. Um, they were in partnership for a few years. Neumeyer left about 1878 to start his own gig. You, we'll talk about that here in just a couple of seconds. Uh, Knast continued until about 1880, um, and then he moved on. Uh, a fire, another fire destroyed the building, which was by then empty. Um, destroyed in 1886. Um, it actually, the ruins of it sat until 1900 um, when it was cleared and, and, uh, and um, cleared for, for local development, for residential development. So, um, <laughs> a lot of burn because, uh, stop and think about it, wood construction and coal, wood heat. Exactly, and most anything powered. That's why um, some of them, I, I really have no idea about these, but natural gas was used. Um, that was always a problem. Um, you know, there were a lot of these things that unfortunately burned up. So um, anyway, that ended, until, or ended that one about 1900. Um, if we travel again, um, we're going to go to the opposite side of town now. Um, we're going to go out on to... Um, actually out to Kalamazoo Avenue, where today's Michigan Avenue meets Kalamazoo Avenue right before you get to the river there, um, right up in here. Um, this was a place called Frank's Brewery. Um, 
and this was operated by an Englishman named Richard Frank. Uh, he opened it in about 1862. Uh, address here was 77 East Main Street, uh, but it was right just west of the Kalamazoo Bridge. Uh, here's that 1867 um, bird's eye view again, uh, clearly shows the brewery sitting right here on the corner. Railroad tracks went through at the time. This of course would be Kalamazoo Avenue and this is today's Michigan Avenue, then Main Street. So that's where those met. Um, today Bell's would be right up around here on the corner. And of course Arcadia would be right down in here somewhere. So again, hallowed ground. Um, but Frank's Brewery, um, that ran for a bit. Um, uh, Frank passed away in 1865 and a guy, another German um, named Henry Schroeder took over. Um, and George Fogel, who was the French master brewer from the opposite side of town, he later joined in with this for a while. Um, and uh, they ran the operation until about 1883. Um, Henry Schroeder was quite a character. He ended up in the papers quite often um, in front of Justice Waddle for selling beer on Sundays, which of course was illegal then. Um, so he was always, it seems like, in hot water for that. Um, he was also quite a character, all the local parades. He would dress up his beer wagon and, and uh, parade his, his wares through town. So uh, it was closed about 1883 for unpaid taxes or uncollected taxes. And uh, one of the articles in the paper um, talks about um, all the thousands of gallons that were dumped into the Kalamazoo River um, when, when, they, uh, um, when they literally attacked the vats in his place and put him out of business. So, um, A gentleman named Albert Frank who owned um, a local uh, tavern actually bought the remains of this in 1884. Um, there really isn't any sign that he reopened it in any fashion though. So uh, probably for materials and things like that. So. That was Frank's Brewery. Um, we've got just a couple more here to talk about. If we travel um, from there um, a little bit south and we'll end up out here on Lake Street. And this is probably a little more familiar territory for us. Uh, this is Portage Street. This would be Lake Street. Um, and there was a brewery right in this spot um, opened uh, by three gentlemen. Um, it was known as Taylor Thackeray and Company. Um, Reuben Taylor, Richard Taylor, and John Thackeray uh, came to Kalamazoo about 1865 um, and opened their brewery out on what was then Olmstead Road. That's We know it today as Lake Street. Um, that was east of Portage. Um, that brewery was also sold um, in by the, the city or by the village in 1872 for uncollect, uncollected 1869 taxes. So obviously they didn't make it too far. Um, and it ended up sitting empty for a few years that way. So, um, so which brings us to um, our third round. Those are, are kind of the, the, the core of things. In this third round, things changed drastically uh, a decade or so after the Civil War. Um, in 1879, we still see four breweries in town. Um, the, the brewery on Asylum Avenue, ran by Leo Canast. Uh, Barney Lockers over there on Walnut Street. Uh, George Newmeyer and the Coldstream Brewery, that's there on Lake Street. Um, and Henry Schroeder's, um, that was out on, on Kalamazoo Avenue, Frank's Brewery. Those four, now three years later, that's down to just two. Um, Locker had closed up and Leo Canast had closed up. Um, by 1884, we're down to just one. So lots happened, and, and there are certainly a million reasons why. Um, the locals at the time always seemed to want to blame the liquor taxes. We all blame taxes, right? Anytime we fail at anything financially, it was, well, the taxes, they, they did me in. Um, 1875, for those brewing 1,500 barrels or less a year, uh, the tax was $50. Um, less than 5,000 barrels would run you 100 bucks. More than that was 200. All the breweries in town fit within those two categories. Um, but really, one of the two main things that did these people in, one being intense competition. Uh, Muskegon Brewery uh, was a growing, huge concern at that point in time. 
Um, and in fact, one of the, um, one of the local uh, bottlers was the exclusive distributor here in town. Um, and um, several articles talk about the tens of thousands of bottles of beer he sold every few months. So um, he obviously pulled a lot in. Um, also, again, back to this Goebbels Brewing Company, they were becoming a huge concern at that point in time. Um, and um, the, uh, one, of the, one of the gentlemen I, I told you uh, earlier was their local distributor, uh, Paps Brewery in Milwaukee, uh, Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, these were becoming huge deals and bringing, you know, because of the rail shipments, they had um, refrigerated cars by then or cooled cars or cooled by ice, but nonetheless, they could transport the stuff easier. Um, so local breweries had to compete now um, with cheap, arguably inferior products. So yeah. Um, tens of thousands, of, if not 20, I'm trying to remember the exact number. They gave a nine month period at one point where it was like 26,000 bottles that this guy turned. So it was huge numbers. In fact, Muskegon Brewery, I think, if I remember right, had the capacity for about 250,000 barrels of beer a year. So they, they were a huge operation at that point for not too long a period of time, maybe a decade, but um, nonetheless, they were huge. So. So intense competition and then the other one here we're back to this temperance thing where you know alcohol was admittedly a problem and there was a big push um, to get things cleaned up and get rid of the saloons get rid of the breweries and such so um, it uh, it wasn't as big a deal here in town as it was perhaps in others uh, but it certainly was. There was, there, was a, uh, there was a big push to clean things up because you can see this, in, again, in the company's advertising. They're constantly advertising that Kalamazoo beer is a, you know, a wholesome, healthy product, you know, and, and uh, yeah, okay, fine. Whiskey had its problems, but this is a good product, so. All right, so we're still out on Lake Street. Now, this is the last of the breweries. All the other ones are closed up and gone. Um, the guys have either passed on or they're on to different, different um, um, ways of making money. So um, a gentleman named George Neumeyer took over in 1878 um, and overhauled, renovated, and enlarged it. Uh, this is the old Taylor Thackeray uh, building that was there on Lake Street. Um, and by 1884, he was producing about 1,500 barrels a year, or the equivalent of about 60,000 gallons. So even at that point in time, that was a pretty significant operation. So um, he called it the Cold Stream Brewery. Um, that was named after um, um, Marilyn McCordy's mill um, just to the, the um, northeast of, of there, just a stone's throw from the... Um, just a stone's throw from the brewery. Uh, they called theirs the Cold Stream Mills, so he obviously adopted the name for this. Um, so that um, was a concern until 1894. Um, his son, Alfred G. or Fred Neumeyer, took over the company from his dad. Um, his dad retired, but still kind of hung around as an advisor, I guess. But, um, and he formed the Kalamazoo Brewing Company. They had a brewer named Leo Wagenman or Wagaman, uh, there are a couple of different spellings, but, uh, um, and made extensive improvements about 1899. Um, at that point in time, they had the capacity to produce about 140 barrels a day. Um, so a uh, pretty significant operation. Um, and these two, um, Neumeyer and Wagenman, had it out at one point in time, and they were gonna leave this now unionized brewery um, they were going to leave it and start a new one um, a little farther to the west, uh, but that never happened and Wagaman um, ended up leaving. So, um, But more renovations. This, of course, is probably the best of any of the pictures we have. I have a couple of pictures of the interior that I'll show you in a minute, but um, really one of the best ones. This was taken about 1896. Uh, I love the wagons and such out front. and, and uh, um, that's the building. Uh, again, this was at the southeast corner of Lake and Portage. So, um, so the Kalamazoo Brewing Company then was formed um, in 1900, uh, $30,000, and that's in $1,900. Um, 
went into new improvements. They added another story onto the building. Um, they hoped their production would double. Um, they converted it to a stock company a few years later and incorporated it as the Kalamazoo Brewing Company. Um, and they really went after with their advertising, pure and without drugs or poison. Um, you'll, you'll see the bottle guys will vouch for this, that the bottles on there will say pure um, and without drugs and poison. Simply because some of these larger concerns, and I'm not blaming the four that I mentioned on there, you know, certainly there were upstanding ones out there, but there are ones that weren't. Um, and they would basically bottle or keg garbage and sell it off as beer. So if it needed to be a little, a little darker, they'd put some tobacco leaves in it. Uh, they put all sorts of different chemicals and things in it to make it fizzy or um, even some chemicals to make it, you know, instead of a to in to the alcohol intoxicating, it was just cheap garbage. And uh, so there was really a problem. People were literally being poisoned by the beer they drank. Um, so the locals really took it upon themselves to advertise, hey, this is a local product made by people you know, uh, made by your brother, made by your father. We know who does it. We know where it comes from, and it's pure. Um, and they were really big about this, building up your hometown, patronize home industry by calling for the brew from Kalamazoo. So I didn't make up the name for the presentation. This is where it comes from. So that's from a, a 1911 ad campaign. Nonetheless, um, this was a big concern and, and was quite, uh, quite productive for quite a while. This is the, the way the building looked after renovation. We see, the new, uh, um, we see the new third level up here for new machinery. Um, and uh, this was taken probably about 1909, or at least that's when it was published. So, um, and some of these inside pictures, we really don't have very many pictures of any of these breweries. In fact, this one brewery is really the only one we actually have photos of. Maybe some exist somewhere, um, but you know, they're not in any public collections, at least that I found yet. So, um, but this is in the, they're, um, they're putting, uh, uh, pumping beer into barrels here. Um, a couple of guys working there. These were taken uh, probably around the early teens. Um, this is one of the motor rooms um, running probably on the south side of the building, at least judging by the way the windows are shaped. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. I love this picture. Um, if you look carefully, he's tending, um, you know, the, the burns, they get these huge ovens. Um, one of the boilers is here. Um, but what I love about this is this gentleman in the doorway back here, you can just barely make him out. Uh, but he's got one hand in his pocket and a beer mug in the other, and, and he's giving a big cheers to the cameraman. So, um, you know, obviously clearly on break or something, but nonetheless. Um, another one, these are the giant vats that would have been in the basement, the lower level. Uh, this is where they aged the ale and such. So, um, so all of these pictures are from the inside of that. Uh, these are a couple of their products, and, and again, you can ask the bottle guys about these. Um, they have a couple of examples of this one on the left. This is one of the brands of the Kalamazoo Brewing Company. This is their Berliner Weiss, um, again, made without drugs or, and, and such, so uh, pure Kalamazoo beer. Um, this one is their Royal, what they call Royal Export. Uh, it was a light ale, kind of pretty much akin to the, the types of of lighter beers that we would get today, like a Budweiser or a Miller, that type of thing. Um, and again, Kalamazoo Brewing Company, uh, pure and without drugs or poison. So really advertising that sort of local angle to this. So, um, And those are quite rare. All right, which brings us to Last Call. As uh, one of the... Uh, um, one of my favorite bar bands way back when used to say, you don't have to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here. Well, it's last call, folks. So in 1915, the local option came out, and it, it was announced in April. And so basically we had a month to clean things out, to get everything, to get rid of everything. And on May 1st, Kalamazoo County went dry. Uh, 65 businesses uh, countywide went out of business that day, including 34 saloons in Kalamazoo and the City Union Brewery. Um, of course, if you notice, this is almost four years uh, before 
national prohibition took effect. So we were a little earlier on the game. We weren't the first by any means, but uh, that's when the local option came through. So uh, that pretty much closed everything up. Um, Kalamazoo Creamery took over the building in 1917, two years later. Uh, they sold off all the brewery equipment, uh, converted it to their purposes, and ran the creamery for um, until about 1997. Uh, when it was closed up and uh, and the building itself was just torn down a couple of years ago in 2011 so Neumeyer sold all of his all of his uh, materials off and such so that really brought brewing to a screeching halt here in town um, literally brewing to a halt until Mr. Bell started his operation in the 1980s so um, a good 60 70 years there with with you know with no breweries in town. Um, so just a really quick recap, we, you know, we talked about the earliest, whoops, sorry, the earliest breweries, uh, those couple, um, one on the west side and one in the center of town. Um, next round was basically seven locals around the time of the Civil War. Um, that was what we would might call the heyday of things. Um, a third round kind of brought it down to Kalamazoo Brewing. That went for several decades. Uh, and then obviously in 1915, uh, um, Kalamazoo went dry and the local option took effect. So um, that's my story. I'm sticking with it. But um, uh, before we leave, uh, do you guys have any questions about things? Uh, like I said, I, I don't by any means claim to be an expert. Um, you guys can get the same information too. It's, it's really a lot of fun. This is all available online. Um, the library makes um, old newspapers like the Kalamazoo Telegraph is available online. Um, so you can search in their keyword search. Um, we have databases that you can access internally that'll allow you to um, access census records, um, all sorts of things like that. So that, that's where all of this comes from. And you can kind of triangulate it and before too awful long, you can put your own story together or whatever type of business you want.